If you or anybody in your family has gotten into trouble with the law, then you probably know that everybody is touched in one way or another. But what if that family member was in trouble for something like murder? What would you do if they confessed to you about it? I mean, would you call the police? Would you make them face perhaps the death penalty? Or would you just keep it quiet, keep it a family secret? Today we're going to meet two mothers who say they face that very dilemma. We're going to find out what they did today on Rolanda. to two mothers here who say they wouldn't know what they would do. I mean, this is a conversation many of you have probably never had with yourself to consider. One mother said, I'd turn them in. The other said, I'm not sure. You may face this dilemma one day. Any of us could. What would you do if your teenager came home and confessed to you that he was involved in a cold-blooded murder? Well, my first guest says that's exactly what happened to her. It was February 5th of this year when police say that two teenagers walked into a convenience store in a working class neighborhood of Los Angeles and shot the storekeeper twice in the back of the head. Police believe robbery was the motive and that father of two is now dead. The story then takes a shocking twist after a frightened woman named Marilyn Ross called the police and told them that it was her two boys who had confessed to the killing. Two sons from one family now in prison and their mother well, she's now in hiding. Marilyn is afraid, she says, after she says she has received threats from a gang that she believes her son belongs to. I'd like you to welcome, joining us here in the studio for this exclusive interview, are Marilyn Ross and her mother, Elsie Newman. This has got to be one of the, the biggest moral dilemmas, I think, that a family goes through. What do you do when all you have is a confession of murder? What, what do you do? Marilyn, you made the decision to turn the boys in. How did all of this come to you? We had a... Nicholas hit me. I called the police on him to scare him up. I went down to the police station and waited two hours while they scared him up. They released him to me, and I went to the donut shop with Nicholas to sit down and talk about it. Mm -hmm. And Nicholas said never to call the police on him again. And I said, anytime you do this, Nick, I'm going to have to call the police on you. you know, he said, no, you can't ever call the police on me again. And I said, why? And he said, you know the shooting that was last Saturday? And I said, yeah. And he said, I did it. What went through your heart? The moment he said it, the look on his face, I knew Nicholas was sincere about what he said. The way he said it, Marilyn, was it, um, how did he say it? How would you describe the way he delivered that bomb to you? With um, gangster mentality. Which is, yeah, I did it. You know, I did it. You got to do what you got to do is what he said. Mm. I asked him why, and that's what his response was. You got to do what you got to do. So this was not only defending or being proud, perceivingly, of this murder, but this had also come after hitting you, his own mother. Yes. That's what started this whole thing in the first place. How old was he at the time? He was 16. 16. Mm -hmm. So when they, you got this confession, what thought process did you go through? I mean, did you immediately say, well, I've got to turn my son in? I wanted to hear the whole thing. I wanted to hear from beginning to end what happened. And he, he told me. Then I took him home, and I called uh, front and center to the kids, and they all came down. And his younger brother told me his part of it. So you have how many children? Three. Three children, and two of your boys? Yeah. Okay, so they are now both confessing to you. Yes, they, they demonstrated it. Demonstrated how they did it? As if in acting it out, showing me what, what he said, what they said, what they did. 
Mm -hmm. And how did, you, as you were watching this story unfold before you, as your sons were telling it, what, describe for me, was it again that gangster mentality that I'm proud of what I've done? I'm, I'm the baddest kid on the block now? I saw no remorse. I saw no remorse. That was what I saw coming from them. And what was going on in me is something left me. Something just was was gone. You know. What was that something, if you could find the words to describe it? The hope, the hope that everything would be all right one day. Um, the future, the dreams that I had for them, um, that was gone. It had to have been one of the toughest decisions ever to say, I've got to make the decision to lose my two boys. Forever, because we've been apart for so long. How do you come to that conclusion? I know it's the right thing to do, but I, I just, my heart goes out to you. I don't know how you, how do you make that kind of decision? What did you go through inside, Marilyn? Um, I call myself a Christian, and I believed that um, the shedding of innocent blood, that God hated the shedding of innocent blood. And the other thing was that, um, who is your mother or your brother, but they that do the will of God. Nicholas and, and his brother had done something that was wrong. And someone else, somebody else's family was suffering. I went to uh, the library that night. I looked up the article, I went to the um, place where it happened, I talked to the people, and somebody else's life, these people were in agony, and I knew that. You know, one of the things that really in, made an impression on me about Marilyn's story, because we are talking about two families here, we're talking about a mother who had to, gosh, what a decision to make, but you're also talking about another family that is without a father, two children, a wife that is left without a husband, and you went to that family. Why? And what did you say? Um, I called her on the telephone after I had gone there. I called her on the telephone. And at first, I was afraid that she would hang up on me because I had to tell her who I was. But we got past that. I made her promise not to hang up when I told her who I was. And she kept her promise, and she didn't hang up. And um, we both cried. Her brother is gone. This was his sister that I called. Her brother mm -hmm. is gone forever. Um, his children no longer have a father. His, his mother is upset every day. Mm -hmm. um, their lives will never be the same, and, and I can't get that back for them. Okay. We have to take a break now. and, and I. When we come back, I wish you could tell me even just what you went through inside in terms of coming to this decision. Was it ever a, a, a situation where you said, no, I can't turn my children in? How did you decide? What was the thought process? And Ms. Newman, we are going to come to you too because you take a totally different position than your daughter does. Another level of a family dissension, how a family copes when one or especially two children in the family end up in trouble. We're going to continue with this right after this. Point. Yeah, the people are afraid to come to the store. I lost my brother, I'm losing my business, I'm losing my family. You know. The lady that you just, um, saw there is the sister of the victim of this shooting we're talking about today. Raj Kumar Sharma is the victim. He leaves behind, as we mentioned before, a wife and two small children who are a whole family who's perhaps grateful that Marilyn made the tough decision that she had to make to turn in her boys for murder. Uh, let's just point out that Marilyn's 15-year-old boy, Joey, was convicted of murder and robbery just last month and sentenced to 10 years in juvenile detention. Her 16-year-old, Nicholas, who has pleaded not guilty, goes on trial any day now, and his mother 
is going to testify in court against him. That is going to be a tough day. How do you muster up the, the courage, the strength, the conviction to do that, to, to testify, to carry the right thing to do all the way? Because in the time that Nick and Joe and I had together, I tried to enforce in them that no matter what happens in life, that you can't do the wrong thing. You've got to somehow endure. You've got to bear up. You know, everybody wants money. Everybody wants to live well. But everybody is not always able to live that way. Mm -hmm. That it's not a crime to be poor. Mm -hmm. Let me bring in your mother, Elsie Newman. Um, Ms. Newman, you take a totally different position on this whole story. And this has caused you quite a lot of pain and anguish in your relationship with your daughter. Yes, I do take a total uh, different view of it because I raised both of those boys from a baby. And I've had those boys with me all their life. Marilyn has only been in her boy's life, I would say, a total of maybe a year. Uh, those boys was raised up in Christian schools, and they was raised up in the church singing in Southside Church of Christ. And I definitely don't feel that those boys are murderers. Mm -hmm. What about the confession that Marilyn says that she heard from each of those boys? The only thing I don't believe Nicholas is the murder. I really feel from my heart that Nikki was kind of railroaded. And the reason why I feel that, because uh, when Marilyn bought the boys to me on February the 12th. She never mentioned to me anything about it. She said to keep the boys until she come back on the Monday. She was going to get a place for them. So what, so what I hear you saying is that you don't believe not only that your grandsons are innocent, but you don't believe your daughter's story of a confession to murder. No, I don't. Why not? Why would... Let me ask you the tough question, because there are going to be some people who are saying, how in the... I mean, a mother wouldn't just make this up. There's a difference in a person who birthed a child in the world and a mother. I kept Nikki and Joy. Nikki, Joy was given to me by a service worker at the age of four months. Mm -hmm. uh, he was four months when, when my daughter mm -hmm. taken him to the uh, so, service. Let me ask you this, Ms. Newman. If you don't believe it, what do you think is motivating your daughter to carry this all the way through to a, a possible conviction for her second son. Well, she and Nick has had many problems before. I would say so. We, yeah, we they mentioned the, the, that he was attacking her, is it, according to Marilyn. Well, uh, I understand it quite different from that. that okay, Marilyn... but let me ask you this. Let's get back to that question. What do you think would motivate your daughter to make up something like that if it wasn't true? Well, as I say, because he resents his mother's ways very much. And Merlin, um, as I say, she has never been there with them. I have always kept them like the doctor, you know, any DPT shot or mm -hmm. any kindergarten school. So why do you think she'd make something up like that on two of her own sons? I cannot say okay. why she would do a thing like that. Uh, I really feel that it was something else involved beside that. Like what? Well, for, for instance, uh, the gun that was uh, taken. And another thing, uh, how, could, uh, how could a 16-year-old tell me that you have to take this gun because I have to protect myself from a gang? Ms. Newman, let me ask you this. If Marilyn had come home to you in her teenage years and said, Mom, I killed somebody, would you take her in? I probably would, but at least I would tell her. I would not get behind her back and have the police to pick her up. I would tell her, and then I still would be Marilyn's friend, because as a matter of fact, Marilyn has been in problem before, mm -hmm. and I never turned my back. I have not back. killed anybody, and I did not go behind their back, hey? I and did not I go behind their back. What were you going to do, Mother? They were at a point where they were completely out of control. And they were out of control before they left your house. They had problems every week at school, at all the schools they ever went to. They had problems. 
Joey hit you. You called no, me. Joey on me. did not hit me. Joey Mother, did not hit me. Joey pushed you down. Joey did not. You hit call me. the police on them. I never call the police on them. If is this is this denial or? I've are, never, I, no. How do you explain I've never what's going on with your mother? Because I, I can't, I'm trying to understand why you don't have more support from your mother. Why don't you think you do? She just won't accept it. Well, the children has never had any support from Marilyn. Because, mother, why? Because you wouldn't let me. That's why. Now, on Nicholas, you would hide them. You would call the police on me. You would tell them I didn't love them. I'd buy them Christmas presents, bring them over there. I'm working. That is far from the truth. Mother, Most of the time, I didn't buy them Christmas presents. I didn't, you didn't take the Christmas presents and hide them. You no, didn't tell them I didn't true. love them. That is not true. And you never manipulated Nicholas and Joy. The truth is that, as I say, Joy was brought to me. Okay. From a social worker. You know, because so, you wouldn't let me stay there after my daughter died after I came home. Jackie could stay there. Philip could stay there. Why? I thought, uh, wait, hold on, hold on. You know something? Yes. We'll never be able to have in the time that we have together understand all the family well, the dynamics. We is, see there's, but let me tell you the truth that we know as, as American citizens as we look at, at your story. We do know that your 15 year old grandson has been convicted of murder. We do know he's that been you're accused of that. Okay, he was convicted. he was convicted of murder and robbery last month, Miss Newman. With all due respect, please let me finish, okay? And your 16-year-old grandson is pleading not guilty, but he goes on trial any day. You might have a second conviction. The question that we're asking here really is not who brought lived with who and that, but what do you do when you're trying to teach the right things? Because we know you're trying to teach all of the people in your family to do the right things. But what do you do when they don't and they confess to you? Do you how far do you go with doing the right thing? Don't you have, I mean, isn't there a sense that you feel kind of proud about what your daughter did? She's standing by her convictions. No way. I don't feel proud about it because in the first place, Nikki is not a murderer. And as I'm saying, Nikki been with me all his life. And that means up to 15 years old. Yep. He was only with his mother for just a very uh, few months. Okay. And uh, true. That is very it is true. not true. Okay, the and reality now the is that, that both of them fact, are Nikki, in jail. No, yes. The reality okay. is, Mother, that there is other witnesses to and the, the crime. And the very truth is mm -hmm. that up until they were 15 years old, they belonged to Southside Church of Christ where they attended. They definitely was not in any gang okay. at all. All right, we have to take a break, and we're going to get more perspective. I know some of the audience members are reacting. Um, I'm, we're going to get another perspective on this whole situation. Uh, Willie Dixon is one of Joey and Nikki's teachers and uh, former teachers, and he knew the boys well. Maybe you can help us sort through some of this and how you teach children about right and wrong and as parents learn how to deal with that very issue as well. We'll be right back in a minute. Yes, well, I'd like to applaud Marilyn for what she did because after all she admitted that her sons were already in gangs, they were already hitting her, and what they were going to do is they were going to just go kill somebody else again if she wouldn't have said anything. Mm -hmm. Thank you. And that's interesting. Let me just hear out of curiosity, um, how many of you in here by, by applause do agree with what Marilyn did? Anybody by hand or applause that would n not have been able to make that type of decision? It's a tough one, right? Tough decision. I'm going to come over there and see what you're thinking. In the meantime, let me bring in Willie, Willie Dixon. Well, you uh, taught the boys, um, and you were another part of their life. As you have watched this story unfold, watched this family change in dealing with this, what is your reaction? What do you... Well, this is a real um, sad situation. First of all, you have someone who's died. You have a mother and daughter that don't get along, are not brought together. So it's really a tough um, situation right here. Um, as I was listening to everything uh, transpire, Joey and Nicholas both didn't have a, I say, a role model or a complete family, a male figure in the household. 
and that causes a lot of children of the day to really split apart. Now, I'm not saying there are not um, single female parents out there that can't do the job. Sure, there's some out there, but overall, you need a complete family unit to really put a good picture together. And when you have at least a piece of a family unit, you have someone like a mother who hears a confession from her son. Okay, what now, are you thinking about how this all went down? When I was listening to this, uh, usually your uh, maternal instincts will come out and try to protect your son. Now, um, no matter, uh, whether it be right or wrong, you're going to try to protect your son. Now, in this case right here, I've taught Joey and Nicholas, and I've only seen Mrs. Uh, Ross one time. One time out of the whole year, I've been seeing Mrs. Newman several times talking to me about her son. In one year span? Yes. Mm -hmm. I mean, over and over. And what is the conclusion you're drawing from that observation? She didn't know her children. She did not know her children. But whether she knew her children or not, or had spent more time in school with them or not, the bottom line, what we hear, is that there was a confession and she took the action of turning in her kid. From what... Now, I've talked to the kids since then and they said they didn't do it. They said they did not do that. Okay, they well a jury has convicted one and that's what that's we true. have to go on. A teacher is a very integral surrogate type parent in the community. And what if one of those kids had come to you and said, Mr. Dixon, I got something to tell you. What would Mr. Dixon have done? It's a tough decision, but what I probably would have done is I would have walked with them, talked to them about it. The bottom line is you're not gonna be able to run and hide forever. And you just won't be able to do it. Mm -hmm. And if you have the right family background behind you, you better work this out. Mm -hmm. And in this case, I don't think that Joey and Nicholas had the um, proper people behind them. I know Mrs. Newman right here has been with them every step of the way. Mm -hmm. Well, we're we in the, the court system and the penal system. Sure we, are. I, we are going to be with them every step of the way now. That's now great. they are our children, too. When we come back, it was a family secret. Another confession, another murder. But you might be surprised by how our next family dealt with a crime, a confession that hit home. We'll be right back. This is uh, one lady who raised her hand when I asked the question, uh, would anybody find it very difficult to make this decision to turn in your kid who's confessed to a crime? And you were like one who said, yes. I mean, I give you credit for doing it. I could never do that. I have three teenagers and I raised them alone with a husband, but alone. The 18 year old decided I'm joining the gang. I'm the biggest one. I'm hip. And I said to him, no, you're not, because eventually you're going to get caught. The father went to the gang and said, this is my child and you cannot have him. He belongs to me. Now, suppose that child had gotten in the gang and done something against the law and came and told you about it, like something as, mm -hmm. as serious as murder. What would I do? What would you do? First of all, my heart would drop. I'd be lost because you know you're going to lose him if it's true. Mm -hmm. If it's not true, you have to go and investigate on your own and take the, the next step. And if it's not true, then you work with it. If it is, you know you're going to lose him. And but that's could the you let that kid go when they, they took a life? No, I have a saying for that. Do the crime, pay the time. Unfortunately, mm -hmm. that's, that's what happened. But it's tough. I mean, this whole thing, this is a, it's, as we were talking about when we were pulling this show together, these thoughts about this particular subject are things I, I have never thought about before. I've never even had to consider that, but you never know when the moral dilemma may come knock on your door. My next guest, Judy, is another mother who had to deal with the agonizing decision of whether to speak up or remain silent. It was a terrible crime that took a year to solve. This 12-year-old girl had been raped and strangled, her body set on fire and dumped in a lot. Police eventually arrested this 16-year-old boy, but as it turned out, he'd already confessed his crime to his own mother. Judy is that mom. She kept this awful secret for more than a year until her son's arrest. She would eventually testify against him at his trial a few months ago, and she is joining us today along with her daughter, Carol. 
a whole year. A long year. Long year. Everybody's waiting, the parents of a 12-year-old girl who's been strangled and raped and burnt and body dumped in a lot are looking for a murder. A community with kids is afraid for one year. A very small community. And you went shopping and you go to the club meeting and you play with the kids and you act like nothing happened. How do you do that, Judy? Not very well. I mean, it's very difficult. Yeah. It was um, a, a difficult time. Mm -hmm. how, did the, how did you know? How did you find out? And what did he tell you? After he had been questioned mm -hmm. voluntarily. Mm -hmm. and by you? By the police. By the police. By mm -hmm. me. He broke out in tears and said, I did it. This was after a year. This was maybe weeks after it happened. And he told you he did it. And what did mother and son, what did you do when that came out? You cry. Together. Together. What did he say as he was telling you? He told me that it was an accident and he panicked. And he cried very hard. Did he have remorse? Still does. A lot. I hear a rumble. I'm wondering if it's the accident part that is making people. How do you accidentally strangle, rape, burn, and dump a body? I will say that I do not believe my son raped her. Mm -hmm. But you do believe what? I do believe the strangulation. I believe that he played a part in that. Mm -hmm. There's a lot to this that we, I don't even know the answers to. Mm -hmm. The so, police don't know the answers to. So what did you tell him after you stopped crying and you said, God, we got to get this together now. We've got to, we got to do something. What did you do, agree to do? I think I was in shock. I, I, this, I think I needed time to get my thoughts together, my wits. Um, I really didn't know how to handle it. Mm -hmm. I didn't know how to deal with it. Let's deal with that period right there. Your gut reaction said what? God help me, I was very sick. Mm -hmm. Afraid, not only for myself, but for him too. How long, did, I mean, did you ever think in those initial moments that, well, we've got to turn you in and you've got to go talk to the police? When the rape issue came out and he told me point blank time and time again that he did not rape her i think i was too afraid to mm -hmm. what were your biggest fears more than anything at any other point in your life at that moment your biggest fear was what is mom that i would lose him mm -hmm. for life mm -hmm. you were part of the family that kept this secret how do you do that I didn't know at first. Um, they kept it all from me. Jim told me that <clears throat> he didn't do it, that he told mom that because there was so much evidence against him. So I took that as, you know, what was the truth? Mm -hmm. I didn't know else to, you know, think. When we come back, I'm going to see what you think as a young lady. Do you think that that that, that mom made the right decisions. And, and tell us a bit as you watched your family deal with this, the things that you learned. Um, and we're also going to continue this conversation, I mean, and ask the audience, what would you have done if you were in a situation such as Marilyn and Judy? What would you do? We'll take a poll of the audience, and also we're going to talk to a psychologist about tough decisions that life throws us sometimes, especially when it comes to moral dilemmas. We're going to ask her about smaller secrets sometimes we keep within the family and when that is going to hurt. How far do we go before we hurt our own families? We'll be right back. Hearts go out to the two mothers we've been spending this this day with because they have had to face uh, a tough decision that, that I don't think any of us would want to ever face. 
Um, joining us in just a moment, we're going to bring in our, our staff psychologist, uh, Dr. Ruth Peters, who's going to help us get some understanding into making tough choices like this. She is our consulting psychologist on this show. Before I come to you, I just want to, to complete the story with um, Judy and Carol. Um, I'd like to, to hear bef how you came to the, the decision that we were going to have to take a bigger action than keeping this crime a family secret. I was subpoenaed before the grand jury, and that's when I told that Jim had confessed. Had you not been subpoenaed, do you think you would have ever let the truth be known? No, I don't, I don't think I would have ever told the truth. Hmm. I see you shaking your head, Dr. Peters. What is that? What I think is going on here is you have to make a, a, a god-awful decision, and a decision between how much you care for your child and what may be right in society. And I think, Judy, in your case, there were a lot of things and that are very different than in Marilyn's case. One is we're talking about intent. You feel that it was accidental. In Marilyn's case, you feel that it was um, premeditated and they were gang members. That makes a big difference. And I think another thing, Rolanda, that's a big difference here in the two is that what Judy is feeling, and I talked to her earlier, is that her son had not gotten in much trouble and it looked like he wouldn't do this type of thing before. Mm -hmm. Whereas in Marilyn's case, he felt that it was just a progression and this was going to happen again and it was going to be a second murder and a third murder. So you have two very different things here. I think Judy's situation is actually more difficult than Marilyn's. Judy's son, by the way, we should point out, is, is spending a life sentence without parole. Do you think that was a fair um, sentence? That's hard for me to say. I'm not because I do believe that there is a price to pay. I also have to point out to everyone that there is still one other person that has not come to trial. Mm -hmm. Carol, what do you think about the decision, that tough, agonizing year that your mom went through, that, and the decision that she finally had to make? I feel that, you know, after everything came out, that was the right decision, you know, to come forward, but I don't think I could have done it either. Mm -hmm. From the audience here. My heart goes out to both of you. Um, I'm not sure about Judy's son if he was in trouble before, but I feel as far as Marilyn is concerned, there has been a family breakup from way back when, and it seems to me that no matter what Marilyn said, she always had, the children always had a mother to say, you're right, or a grandmother to say, you're right. So there was always that miscommunication and it seems to me they were threatening Marilyn because they thought grandma would always stick up for us or we always got out of trouble no matter what mom said but it's my question is, is, no, is it was the other the, way around oh, okay. it really did, was the other way around did the Mother, younger you know, one confess did. in court I mean I know he's been convicted now did they confess to anyone other than you Marilyn yes they did as a matter of fact, they haven't even found true evidence. The only uh, witness that they're supposed to have is Marilyn's word. Mother, they have I've two been to court other every witnesses. I've been to court every time those boys went to court. I think they had to have more than just Marilyn's statement to get a conviction well, on I murder. Think, I mean, I, I, know that, I know have, that about our but, losses. But, you know, I, mm -hmm. there was no evidence shown. Okay. I mean, like a gun or like the kids was there. His, what Marilyn had said. Okay. And, uh, the Marilyn jury seemed to think there was enough evidence for a conviction, though that is what we do know. Um, question. You have a beautiful, beautiful young daughter, Judy. Thank you. Had it happened to her, would you want the mother to have kept that a secret from, from you and your family? I just, I, I, I'm not trying to judge any of you because I don't know how this could have happened, but to hear that and that kind of abuse happens once and it won't happen again because he's a white white boy in a good family. I'm just, I'm very upset. Thank mm -hmm. you, Rolanda. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Also coming up, a police officer reminds us that doing the right thing by the law is doing the right thing for your community and eventually your family. So we will continue this conversation after this.
today, uh, really tossing over a moral dilemma, one that we hope that we never have to face, but certainly hearing enough information to put ourselves in those shoes and trying to wonder what in the world we would do if a family member came to us and told a secret that might be too big to keep, one like, I have just killed somebody, what do I do? Um, I want to bring in um, uh, our homicide detective who's joining us. He deals with this kind of situation an awful lot. I want you to meet Detective Bill Clark. Um, how, how rare is it in a case where a parent comes in and says, I've got some news to tell you that is difficult, but my kid has just confessed to me what I never dreamed I would hear, but he needs to be arrested. How often do you come across that? I've been in homicide for 19 years, and, and I've never had a parent actually come forward saying that their son has confessed, but I've got a lot of cooperation from parents in eliciting statements from children uh, that they have been involved in homicides. Mm -hmm. What about parents? See, because a lot of people's gut reaction is that parents would go to the death with, to protect their kids. You know, I'm not going to lose my kid, even if it's to, to the prison system. Um, how often do you see that kind of, do you, do you see the reverse, I guess is what I'm asking? Well, I'll tell you the truth, uh, just very recently, I had two cases in a row where uh, one was a double homicide, two stick-ups that a 15-year-old boy went out and did, and the uh, parents uh, were very instrumental. The father actually forced the boy to tell us the truth and told him he'd be a man about it. If you did it, tell the detectives you did it. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and a boy confessed to two homicides. Mm -hmm. and, How uh, important, are, well, I, listening to what you're saying, parents play an extremely important role in all of this in terms of you're cracking your case, in terms of I having a safer society. Yeah, I think that uh, to think that we live in a society that parents being told by their children that they committed murder uh, wouldn't come forward, I, I think is, is stretching. I like to think we live in a, a little better society. Yes, my question is for Mrs. Ross. I was wondering if your second son is com not convicted of the crime, do you fear for your life that he'll come after you for revenge? I um, constantly heard that um, the gangs, you know, want me dead. They consider it a snitch. I consider it the truth. Mm -hmm. You are right now saying that you're living in, in fear of your own life because you've received some threats, you say? Just as recently as last week, we received a call on the answering machine saying that um, they would like to set us on fire and burn us alive, Mother. Question. Well, I, I don't know anything about that, but I do know on the seventh. <laughs> I do know on the seventh of this month that it was reported to the police the that you called wait, wait, hold on. and told me it was over for me. You threatened okay. me, Mother. I have never threatened I you. I have never place. done anything but oh, try. Okay. One, one question. If you had the opportunity to tell him if to not to turn him in, would you do it again? Or would you have turned them in? Hold on, we've got to take a break, but that is a good question. If you had to do it all over, would you make the same decision? We'll be right back. The last, for the last break, we asked you the question, if you had to do this all over again, would you make the same decision? Judy? Yes, I would. To not say anything? I don't think I could. Okay, and Marilyn, what about you? I'd do the same thing. And that is to turn your son down. <laughs> Let me just ask very quickly, Detective, um, I, I, I'm trying to find out, would Judy be in trouble if, the, if when the courts find out that she's been holding this in for a year and didn't tell? Isn't she liable in some way? No, I don't, not legally. I mean, it would be a question if she started sending the police off in wild goose chases and things like that. And part of making the decision, Dr. Peters? Well, I think that what you have to look at here is why this all actually happened. And you might want to say that because of the breakup in the family here between Marilyn and her mom, that might be one of the reasons that the boys got into the gangs. That could be. And something else Marilyn needs to continue to think about is she might have saved their lives by getting them perhaps in prison and not in the gang. Mm -hmm. And the last thing I want to say is that we all sit in judgment very easily saying, yep, no problem, we'd turn our kids in if they murdered. But I wonder if we went one by one through all the audience and said, would you you do it? Would you do it? Would you do it? Mm -hmm. I have a feeling a bunch of people would say, I don't know. Would you do it? 
don't know. Thank we'll you. <laughs> you did have a question, though. Yes, my question's for Judy and Carol. How is your tra ca town treating you now that they know that you held it in, and how is your school treating you if you're in, still in the same community? Good question. Um, I'll answer that. Um, the school has been very supportive for Carol, and as far as how the town treats me, it was still my testimony that did basically get the arrest mm -hmm. that allowed the police to arrest them. Um, so I didn't walk out of this scot-free. Nobody is a winner in this case, ever, ever. Mm -hmm. and, and what you have to live with for the rest of your lives, reliving this as a family must be difficult too. Very. We'll be right back in a minute. I'm not a parent, but I think if I was watching this show and I was a parent, I would say, boy, this only reiterates what a job I got to do. Um, good parenting starts from the beginning. I know that's what you were pointing out, Mr. Dixon, that if good parenting starts out, you don't get, hopefully, into these, good situ these situations. Um, I, I know, Marilyn, you've taken a lot of flack today about whether you were there during the development years with your sons or not. The question came up in the audience, where were you during that time? I was in Los Angeles. In Los Angeles? Since the boys were Is five and seven. Mm -hmm. Why were you not a part Is of their true? life? As because much? my mother and I cannot get along. I think we got a hint of that today. <laughs> yeah. I think we got a hint of that. Talk about good parenting. Yeah. I am not going to sit here and tear you apart, okay. but we need to look at the parenting that preceded Nikki and Joe. And we parenting. right now need to look at Nick and Joe. You have not seen your sons and you have an opportunity now to say something to them. They could be watching this show from behind bars. Mm -hmm. What would you say? And I'll just let you close the show on that. To Joey, I would like to tell him that I'm proud of him for halfway telling the truth. To Nicholas, we talked about this, and he knew this would happen if this is the choice that he made. And I want to ask Nicholas to please tell the truth for his soul's sake. I think that's what Nick is waiting on you to do, because he told me to tell you to come to jail to see him if you really cared about it. And him. we will say goodbye on that note. Good luck to all of you, fans. Thank you. Thank you so much.